Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Therapeutic Modalities on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. So now back to our cryotherapeutic modalities. The first we're going to talk about is a cold or an ice pack. This is pretty straightforward. You have an ice pack, it's stored in a freezer, you pull it out of the freezer, and generally we're going to put it in a pillowcase before applying it on the patient's skin. Now depending on the source that you're looking at, some may say put it in one pillowcase, some may put it in two. Really it just boils down to patient preference. Some patients will be okay with one pillowcase around the ice pack, some will want more pillowcases, some people may not want any pillowcases. So you just have to ask the patient. Now the energy transfer here from the ice pack to the skin is through conduction. And the temperature of the ice pack is between 32 and 41 degrees Fahrenheit, so just above freezing. In degrees Celsius, that's 0 to 5 degrees. And then we usually leave the ice pack on for about 10 to 20 minutes in order to achieve that pain reduction, right? That's our goal. Now, a lot of times what you'll see at the end of a physical therapy session is they'll put the ice pack on for about 15 minutes, which is right in the middle of that time frame. Okay? Again, the exact time it's going to take to reduce pain really depends, first of all, on the patients, and it depends on how many pillowcases that you have covered with the ice pack. The more pillowcases that are on there, uh, the more time it's going to take to achieve that pain reduction. And so that is a precaution. We're going to usually cover it with a pillowcase, but it's only a precaution because some people may actually not even want a pillowcase in the first place. Some other considerations for the ice pack is, one, you can have the region of the body elevated. Okay, that's important. Remember our rice method, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Okay, and it also allows a longer treatment time when we compare it to ice massage. Ice massage can only be used a max of five to 10 minutes. Um, some sources will actually say cut it off at five. Uh, so 10 is really pushing it and you have to be careful. But with uh, ice packs, you can have up to 20 minutes. Now, why would that be advantageous? Well, suppose at the end of a PT session, you're using TENS or IFC, right? Well, those usually go about 15 minutes. Well, it'd be nice if you could have a treatment to go with it that also can be done for 15 minutes. And so a cold pack or ice pack is perfect for that. The second modality we have is the ice massage. And you can see the device over here that's used to give the massage. And this right here is actual frozen ice. And we'll look at a video of how it's actually done in a couple of minutes. Now for ice massage, instead of conduction, the energy transfers for convection because the ice is not going to be static on the body. It's going to be moving over the surface of the body that we're treating. Now with ice massage, one important thing is that a PT or whatever responsible practitioner has to be present for it. And that's because if you have somebody doing an ice massage that doesn't know what they're doing and they just sit the ice on there and stop moving it, well, actually, that one part of the body is receiving a lot of cold, and it can actually become frostbitten. And so you do need someone skilled to be able to do this who knows what they're doing, even though, as we'll see in a few minutes, it's actually really, really simple. Um, again, with an ice massage, you can also elevate the area that you're treating. And really what you're doing here is you're massaging with small overlapping circles. So unlike an ice pack, which remains on the body statically, you have to keep the ice massage moving. You're not leaving it on one part of the body and then just walking away. That's a good way to cause frostbite. So it needs to keep moving, kind of like an ultrasound, and in small overlapping circles. Now, doing an ice massage between three and five minutes, really closer to the three minutes, you're going to get muscle facilitation. I'm sure you've heard that saying, when it's cold outside, you see all the horses running around, they get frisky when it's cold. That's kind of the way to think about it. Okay. When muscles get cold initially, they actually get more activation. Um, eventually, they'll actually relax, but at first, they actually get more activation, and so you can facilitate some stronger muscle contractions initially in the cold. After about five minutes, though, we start to see pain reduction, and that actually has to do with the numbness that we talked about achieving on one of the previous slides. Now, let's see how we actually perform an ice massage. So as we mentioned, we're doing the ice massage in small circles over the affected area. Okay, so here is the device. And basically, I'm just going to pull this thing out. And there's my ice right there. That's what's going to be applied to a certain part of the skin. So I'm going to do that right here. Do it on my forearm. 
and I'm just moving this around in small overlapping circles like that. Now when you do this particular treatment, you're only doing it on a small part of the body. So maybe something with a diameter of about six inches. Okay? Um, if it's a very large region, uh, you're not going to use ice massage. So this needs to be a pretty small area where the patient's feeling pain. You also want to avoid doing the ice massage directly over bony prominences. So for example, in the spine, let's say you're doing an ice massage on the erector spiny muscle group. Well, the spinous processes of the vertebra are right next to that. And so you want to avoid the ice massage on those spinous processes because just like bone heats up faster than other tissues, it also cools down faster than other tissues. And so that can actually cause damage to the bone. Other areas you want to be very careful would be the clavicle. That's a bony prominent sticking out, uh, lateral epicondyle of the elbow, stuff like that. You also want to limit the ice massage to about five minutes at a time. So I know I said before about five to ten minutes, that was one source. Um, but this is where it's really important to screen your patient for sensation in that area and also uh, good communication with them so that they understand what they're supposed to feel. So remember on one of the previous slides, we talked about starting at uncomfortable cold and then to stinging and then burning or aching and then eventually to numbness. Well, once the patient gets to numbness, that treatment is over. You don't need to do it anymore. If they achieve numbness at three minutes, well, you're probably done, right? Numbness means no pain. And then once there's no pain there, you can actually do an exercise that would normally have been painful, but they're numb there, so they're not going to feel that pain with that exercise. And you can repeat this ice massage two to five times a day. So if the patient, let's say, was actually having issues with knee extension because they had some problem with the patellar ligament, they'll just do an ice massage on the patellar ligament, right? And then once they're numb, you can do knee extension exercises. As soon as they start to feel the pain again, do another ice massage. And so what this allows you to do is in the middle of a treatment session, it allows you to kind of get a little bit more bang for your buck. You get more out of the patient because they're not actually feeling that pain. And so notice here, after numbness is achieved, gentle, minimal stress movements can be made. So let's watch that ice massage here. Very simple, about a six inch diameter there overlapping circles on the affected area. So this could be right here, for example, if I had tendinitis of the flexor tendons in my forearm. The third modality here is what's called a controlled cold compression unit. That's actually what you see down here in the bottom right. So this is often used following joint arthroplasty. So following a total shoulder, a total hip replacement, a total knee replacement. And so when you have those procedures, there's a lot of swelling. And particularly with the total knee replacement, or if there's an ankle surgery, uh, you're at risk for a DVT, a blood clot. And that can be disastrous if it breaks loose because it can cause a pulmonary embolism, for example. So getting blood flow back to the heart is extremely important following these surgeries. So one, this device acts to compress, and that actually helps to uh, get venous return back to the heart but also it applies cold. And so you can see this wire here is actually hooked up to uh, the compression. And it goes to this box right here, which basically contains ice. And so not only do you get compression, you also get ice. This is also important because following some of these surgeries, you have a lot of inflammation. And yes, some inflammation is necessary, but normally after these surgeries, it's excessive. So we apply cold to the area to help reduce that inflammation. It also helps reduce pain. Remember, cryotherapy is for reducing inflammation and reducing pain. Now this device uh, promotes energy transfer through conduction, like the cold or the ice pack. Uh, the temperature is actually a lot warmer than we see with the ice pack. So it's about 50 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's not totally freezing because we don't want to get frostbite, right? We want to be able to use this longer term. And that equates to about 10 to 25 degrees Celsius. Now, one of the weaknesses of this technique is unless you remove the device, you can't move or visualize the area. So this person is not going to be able to do a lot with their ankle, so ankle mobility. Uh, and you're also not going to be able to visualize the incision from the surgery unless you take the device off. Whereas with ice massage, you're just moving that thing so you can visualize the area. With a cold or an ice pack, we'll just move the ice pack and you can see the area. So that's a weakness of the controlled cold compression unit. But again, it allows compression. Uh, you can elevate the affected area. Again, just elevate the leg in this case. And it provides cold to reduce pain and inflammation. And as we said, it's often used during post-op surgeries or arthroplasties and so on and so forth.
The last one we'll look at is what's called vapocoolant spray. This is literally a spray that you put directly on the skin. Let's actually take a look at that. So right here, this person is applying vapocoolant spray really to kind of the neck right here, this upper trapezius on the right side. So this would be useful if a patient actually has tightness in that muscle and you needed to stretch that muscle. Well, what is tightness of the muscle? Well, it's overactivation of the muscle. And so what the vapocoolant spray does is it gets on the skin there and then it actually promotes cooling via evaporation. So uh, the spray pretty much immediately evaporates from the skin and it takes heat with it. So by removing the heat, by default, uh, this region actually becomes cold. And what it actually does is it provides this counter irritant stimulus that ultimately results in decreased motor neuron activity. So with decreased motor neuron activity, this muscle is somewhat inhibited. Now a few considerations here for the vapocoolant spray. Uh, number one, it's applied at a rate of about 10 centimeters per second at about this distance from the skin um, and also at an angle of about 30 degrees from the skin. Okay, so it's not applied directly perpendicular down on it. Uh, we apply it at a 30 degree angle from the skin. Also notice the patient's holding up this protective screen that's preventing that spray from one getting in their eyes and also getting into their nasal passages because uh, if you inhale it, it's a very strong irritant to the respiratory tract. The other thing is we don't want to overuse it because we can actually induce frostbite if we use the spray too much. Now, it's not enough just to spray the stuff on the skin. Okay? Yes, it does cause less motor neuron activity, which means the muscle's not gonna be as tight, but we now need to use that and do something useful. Well, if the muscle is no longer tight, what can we do? We can stretch it, okay? Now we can stretch the muscle, and so what this uh, PT is actually doing is promoting an upper trapezius stretch on the right side. So stretching while exhaling. Once the stretching is done, we're then going to rewarm it up. So we're gonna use thermotherapy that we talk about in another video. This is superficial moist heat, and we're gonna heat that area, so right on that right upper trap. And then after moist heat, then we can do active range of motion exercises. In this case, we wanna do things like cervical rotation, cervical lateral flexion, because those are things that would actually be uh, reduced by a tight upper trapezius, okay? If you wanna see an actual demonstration of vapocoolant spray, you can click on this link. It'll be in the description of this video. So hopefully now you understand these four major cryotherapeutic modalities. Let's actually look at an example problem and see how we might actually figure out which one to use. So we have a patient here that has moderate severity low back pain, so it's six out of 10, in the erector spiny region, which is, that's a muscle around the spine, right? Around the L2 level. And that pain is exacerbated by back extension activities. However, what we need them to do is what's called repeated extension and standing exercise. So basically back extension exercise in order to centralize their radicular symptoms. Which modality is best to use in this situation? Okay, so first of all, what is the aggravating factor? Back extension. What do we need them to do? Extension, back extension, right? So how on earth could we get a patient to do back extension if back extension is what gives them this six out of 10 pain? Well, let's think about it. Would we use an ice pack? Well, theoretically we could, right? But remember with an ice pack, in order to achieve that pain reduction, it's gonna take somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. So let's say 15. So we would apply the cold first, maybe for 15 minutes, and then we would do the repeated extension and standing. But then eventually that pain's gonna come back once you start doing these exercises. So we need to apply that again. And 15 minutes twice, we just burn 30 minutes of the session right there. So it takes up a lot of time to use an ice pack. We could do it, uh, but it's gonna take up a lot of time. I think you're starting to see where we're going with this. What about an ice massage? Well, remember to achieve that pain reduction, we only need to go about five minutes. So now we do an ice massage for five minutes, then do repeated extension and standing, and then an ice massage for five minutes, and then more of this. And notice with this progression right here, we just use 10 minutes on an ice massage versus 30 on an ice pack, okay? So the ice massage for something like that where you're gonna to have to do an exercise that was once painful and then maybe do the ice massage again, you're saving a lot of time here because it doesn't take as long to get that pain reduction. Cold compression unit, no, we wouldn't use that. Uh, that's really just for peripheral joints like the shoulder, knee, hip joints, 
when we have post-op arthroplasties. What about vapo coolant spray? Yes, it does decrease pain, but this is normally used to induce stretch. So, for example, if we applied vapo coolant spray to that small region of the erector spiny muscle, then our next step would be to stretch the erector spiny muscle, which would actually be spinal flexion, not extension. Okay, so the best answer here is actually ice massage. Again, we could use ice packs, but the ice massage is going to be a better use of time because that treatment doesn't take as long as the ice massage. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the four major cryotherapeutic modalities. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.